So in this video, I'm going to show you a really useful approach for problem solving, particularly in chemistry. We call it the steps in problem solving, or the SIPS method, that we use in our general chemistry course frequently. And what this will allow you to do is will allow you to be able to plan and solve quantitative chemistry problems. Um, we'll also introduce a couple of different units, uh, density and concentration, um, which you might already have encountered before in a high school class, but we'll just kind of get it in there so you know you, can, you have that at your disposal. So the first is uh, when we think about unit conversions, that comes up pretty common in chemistry. And that's really just a, an approach of exchanging things based on math. So we can take a relationship that we know, such as there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms in one mole of atoms. And we can actually use this to then be able to do some conversions. So let's imagine we divide both sides by one mole of atoms. You might be wondering why we would do that. Well, over on the right side, we can get things to cancel out and that's just gonna equal one. Well, the place that, that this now becomes really useful is that if we had three moles of atoms and we actually wanted to know how many total atoms there were, what we can do is we know that we can multiply anything by one. And when we multiply something by one, it remains unchanged. So now if we have our three moles of atoms and we multiply that by one here, well, we could do a little substitution and we could actually substitute in this version of one up here. And so if we do that, then we now have a new equation that we can put in there and we know that the value is gonna remain unchanged. And so we can do the math. We can see that our moles of atoms will, will nicely cancel out. And then we can uh, calculate that out. We now figured out, oh, our three moles of atoms is really the same as 1.8 times 10 to the 6 times 10 to the 24th, uh, 1.806 times 10 to the 24th atoms. And so it gives us a way to be able to convert between different sort of things in, in a really useful way. And one of the things I want to point out is we had that initial relationship of 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms was one mole. And we used it this way, but we could have divided by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms and gotten this relationship instead. So when we have these equalities, we can actually use that to interconvert between different kinds of units on things. That's what we mean when we talk about a unit conversion. Now this actually goes into what I tend to think of as the chemistry toolbox. Um, how do we use unit conversions? And we've introduced a couple of these as you just saw. So one, we can interconvert between items and moles using Avogadro's number. That's what we just did. Um, we've also previously seen that we know what formula weight is. That allows us to interconvert between moles and mass. And so these are things that we always have at our disposal. We can do the same kind of idea with density. You're probably familiar with that, right? That talks about the number of grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter or something. And so here we have the values for water and gold. And those allow us to interconvert between volume of material and the mass of a material. In high school chemistry, you may have encountered the concept of molarity. That's the same kind of thing where it allows us to be able to interconvert between volume of a solution and moles of the solute in that solution. And so that can be another really useful thing that you may have seen previously. Um, and we'll see that in a couple different ways. So here are a couple different examples. Something that could be a 0.5 molar um, solution of bleach or uh, 2.5 times into the negative third molar um, sodium chloride solution. Now, one of the things to recognize is if we consider Avogadro's number in this relationship here, this is a constant value. It holds true for everything. But these other ones we have, formula weight, molarity, and density, well, those are all compound or situationally dependent. Okay, And so that's something to recognize. When we think about our chemistry toolbox, though, we also have a variety of other conversions that we always have access to. So one good example would be when we think about our SI units, right? We can convert between length in millimeters and meters or to kilometers or to any other sort of relationship that we might actually know. And so these are always something that's available to us in any sort of chemistry problem that we're addressing. So we can convert between any different length. And that also includes converting over to English units. So if we want to convert to inches or feet, for example. The same is true in volume. We can convert between uh, liters and milliliters or centimeters cubed, right? That's the same as one milliliter. If we think about mass, it could be between grams and kilograms or uh, milligrams or whatever. And so really trying to understand all these things is really important. And so understanding and knowing the different relationships, how many of one thing or another with those prefixes become really important. So knowing that milli, there needs to be a thousand millimeters in one meter or a millimeter is 0 0.001 meters. So knowing these relationships will be really helpful for you in the course. And one of the things to keep in mind is that these conversions are always available to, for you to use. So in any problem, these can always be one that's just to be expected to be brought in. We also have some additional tool, uh, tools that come from chemical reactions. So the balanced chemical equation actually provides additional conversions. So let's imagine that we have that, that equation we've looked at, the combustion of methane, well, what we know is that the number of molecules of methane that we have is going to be related to the molecules of O2. And again, that's going to be based on 
the balanced equation. And so we can use that, and we've got two different relationships here. We've got two moles of O2 per one molecule of CH4, methane, or we can flip that around and do it the other way. Of course, now you also know that we could just do this directly with moles, right? Because there's a relationship there. And this is much more common that we tend to do in chemistry and just use it right in terms of moles. And so we can use those two relationships. So when we have a balanced equation, that actually provides us with a bit of information. So what does that do? Well, let's imagine we had a question such as how many moles of O2 will react with 2.3 moles of methane? Well, we go to our equation. And then we know that there's a relationship, right? The moles of methane is going to be related to the moles of O2. And so we end up with an equation like this. We use that balanced equation to know what that ratio is and to interconvert between one and the other. And so we have those two relationships. And so in this case, if we would say, okay, well, I got 2.3 moles of methane. So I'm going to want to choose that situation where I have methane on the bottom so that my units are nicely going to cancel out. And then I'm going to be able to do the math and I'll get that, hey, this is 4.6 moles of O2. Now that's a pretty simple question and it's unlikely you're going to see very many of these in the chemistry class. We can imagine making this just a little bit more complex. So what if it was how many grams of O2 that we have? Okay, well we can just do a little bit of addition here. So we could say, well for moles of O2 we need to get the mass of O2 because we know a conversion that we always have in our pockets is that formula weight, right? Formula weight always allows me to convert between moles and mass. And so I can look up the formula weight on the periodic table and we could be in good shape. So what that means is we're going to start with that same calculation, but now we need to add in one more new piece here, right? We need to go this last step, go from moles to mass, and we said, hey, we need the formula weight. So that's where this comes from. And so we put that in, our units cancel out, and then we can do the math and we get to 147.2 grams. So hopefully you start to see how this can be useful. Well, you could also imagine, okay, often we can't measure moles, so maybe we would have known how many grams of methane that we started with. Okay, again, still doable. We still have the same kind of core idea of things that are together, but now we need to start over here from mass of methane. And so this needs to be our starting point. And we're gonna use the formula weight to go between mass and moles, just like we did over here. And so we look at our calculation. We need to start here with grams of methane. Now we see this first jump is gonna take that formula weight. So we go, we find the formula weight of methane. These next two steps are the same. So we use these same conversions here. And then we make sure that everything nicely cancels out. And then we can do the math and we can get our answer. So what we see is this sort of approach of building up the relationship here allows us to be able to see and sort of plan for our calculation. We use all these known tools to figure out the jumps that we can make successfully. Now, of course, this could be even a little bit harder. So it could be how many grams of water will be made by 2.3 grams of methane. Okay, well, we still have to start over here in the methane. We go through the same piece. But now we want to uh, get to mass of water. So we need to do a little bit of a change here. So let's see, some of those pieces aren't gonna be relevant, so we can shave those out. Ah, uh, yeah, so now we need to go from moles of methane to moles of water, right? But the way that we do that is still gonna be that balanced equation. And then going from moles of water to mass of water, that's gonna be our formula weight. So we can see we've created just a slightly altered path, but you can see that it's still really similar to what it looked like before. So in terms of the math down here, so we start with our methane, we do that same conversion here, but now the relationship we need goes from moles of methane to moles of water. So we go to the balanced equation and we use that same piece here. We then add in the formula weight of water, make sure that everything cancels out really nicely, do the calculation and we can get to an answer. And so what we see as we look at this, right, is that there's a lot of different relationships that we have here. And so when we have this uh, balanced chemical equation, we actually know we could go between any of the different species that are involved here. So between methane and oxygen or reactants and CO2 and water, the products. But if we think about that, and we can do that through the balanced equation. If we think about the methane though, we know that we can get to mass of methane using the formula weight, and then we can get to the um, volume if we had the density. So that would be one example. Um, if this was in a solution, for some reason, then we could use the molarity and that would allow us to be able to get over here, or we could use Avogadro's number to be able to actually figure out the number of molecules. And so what we see is that there's a whole bunch of ways that this can pull together. But of course, not only can we do that for methane, but we can do that for CO2, for water, and then also for O2. And so we actually get this really big complex web of all these different um, kinds of things that could be asked. And so let's um, sort of think about what this could look like and how this might play out, how having this in your mind can be really useful. This allows us to actually be able to answer lots and lots of different questions, such as what volume of CO2 will be produced by the combustion of 20.2 grams of methane? 
And so, well, we're starting here at the methane and we need to get over here to the volume of CO2. And so what we wanna do is we wanna find the path that gets us there. And so we can see, hey, look, there's a path that comes through here. And so that path is gonna be what we need to then um, develop and create our equation to actually solve this for. You can imagine that there could be some other kinds of questions that might be asked. So if the combustion of methane created 40 liters of CO2, what mass of water would have been produced? Okay, so we have to find our starting point and our ending point, and then we look for that path that connects those two. And essentially what you're trying to do in many of these um, questions is you're trying to actually figure out what that relationship is. And so essentially this whole path might be in your head, but you're finding, trying to find the most relevant piece. Um, what's important about this is that really any of these circles could be your start and any circle could be your finish, depending on how evil your uh, faculty member is feeling like. Or we could just change the equation, right? And that sort of changes the relationship here. And so it's really useful to sort of see how all these kinds of questions fit together. When we talk about stoichiometry, it's just really talking about doing these inner conversions and having this core piece in the middle where we're using a balanced equation to be able to understand the relationships between each other. So we'll continue to use this throughout the, the semester, but it's really helpful to kind of have that little bit longer um, dive into it so you can really get a good understanding of it.